This is Ed Driscoll for PajamasMedia.com, and we're talking with Rob Long, one-third of the troika of podcasters at Ricochet.com, along with James Lilix and Peter Robinson. And Rob, as I understand it, you're coming to us from on the road to wine country, sunny Napa, California. I'm on 80, or the 80, as we say in Southern California, uh, and I'm just about, I don't know, about 45 minutes from Napa. From, from the Napa Valley, from the wine country. I should be 20 minutes from the wine country, but uh, I'm just, uh, I just get late delayed, and I put it all off, and now I have to be there at 6 o'clock, so it's a little bit um, kind of a nail-biter if I'm going to make it or not, because there's a little traffic. So if, you, if there's an unusual strain in my voice, it's only <laughs> because I'm realizing now that and Google Maps does not lie. When they say it takes an hour with traffic, it really does, and there is traffic, so um, I'll figure it out. Well, we'll try and overdub some great, you know, Hollywood car chase screeches. And <laughs> yeah. Anything that, anything that suggests movement rather than what this is now is <laughs> very slow crawling, crawling through Pinhole Valley. First of all, I wanted to ask you about the immediate future of Ricochet, because Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, recently said that he's calling for a temporary end to partisan bickering for the sake of the country. And given that the price of a Ricochet membership is tied to the price of a Grande Latte at the flagship Starbucks in Seattle, does that mean that you'll be putting the site on hold until next November to comply with (laughs) Schultz's wishes? No, no, we're going to try to encourage him to raise his prices. Um, Even now we're starting to think of like, well, maybe we made a terrible error because they don't seem to be going, uh, the prices don't seem to be going up north as as quickly as we wanted them to. (laughs) So we might have to peg the Ricochet membership to some other commodity that's going up, you know, farther and faster and farther. So, um, you know, it's more, it's, well, you know what, the thing is that whenever you hear the phrase, put aside partisan bickering, it's, you always know what that means. That means do what we want, just shut up and do what I'm telling you to do. It doesn't mean, it does, I mean, you, people, when people disagree with you, you tend to think of them as bickering. Um, I, I like partisan bickering. I don't think it's bickering either. I think these are are principled. For the first time ever in a long time, these are principled disagreements. I mean, you know, Howard Schultz is the guy, he's a billionaire, he lives in Seattle, who thinks, um, like uh, Warren Buffett, that uh, that the the small business owner and the the small taxpayer should just roll over and let this all happen. And he's, he's mistaken. Anyway, is that enough of a rant for you? I mean, that's, that's, whenever I hear that, you know, you're not, it's never partisan bickering they want to put off. It's, it's actually actual disagreement. And I think it also implies that whoever calls for the end of partisan bickering is losing the argument. Oh, exactly, exactly, right, exactly. And and notice, notice now we're hearing more about partisan bickering than we ever did when Bush was president, and we're hearing more about how well maybe the job of the presidency is something broken in our constitution more than we ever heard before. Uh, when, when a liberal starts failing, then they start uh, worrying about the institution of partisan bickering. Back in July, we spoke with Ben Shapiro about his new book, Primetime Propaganda, in which he discussed the longtime liberalism of the television industry. And what's your take on the liberalism of the medium? And we know that you yourself, you know, you're a far left, radical chic kind of guy. But, but what is it like for someone on the starboard side of the aisle to work in that medium? I, I take issue with some of what Ben Shapiro suggested. I mean, the stories he collected of people not getting hired or people, um, you know, uh, not getting work or projects being passed on. I mean, I can't gainsay that. I, if, if that happened, that happened. It's never happened to me. I mean, that I know of. Uh, whereas the opposite has happened. I can think of. I mean, I could probably. I mean, I can think of of, of opportunities that I've had from liberals precisely because they know me as a conservative. So yeah, they, they wanted, maybe I want, they wanted cover or they wanted that perspective or they wanted something. So I've actually made a little bit of money from, by being a conservative in Hollywood. Just, I'm just speaking me personally. Other people have different, have had different experiences where I sort of disagreed with the book a little bit. And I like Ben very much. and I like the book very much where I disagreed with it was in this sort of this all in kitchen sink attitude about what, con- what constitutes liberalism that, you know, he tried to actually make, uh, what I thought was a you know a cockamamie uh, a, a point that um, Cheers the TV show Cheers which I worked on for many years I mean I was the executive producer of it in the last couple seasons that that was somehow a liberal show which is just nonsense and a few other things I mean you know there were liberal TV shows on the air and they and and when the politics are overt in Hollywood they're almost always left wing and that's irritating and bad and in general uh, you know something that we should uh, 
uh, shake a, you know, shake the trees and try to get changed. But um, it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, I always say the same thing, which is the generation that grew up watching the very sanitized, um, very controlled, very uh, patriotic and pulled together and frankly conservative sitcoms of the 50s, like Leave it to Beaver. That generation grew up to riot in the streets in the 60s. And a generation that grew up watching the very left-wing, very political, very partisan sitcoms of Norman Lear, like All in the Family, well, they grew up to vote for Ronald Reagan. So, you know, you can take these things too far. One other question about primetime propaganda. In the last chapter of Ben's book, he describes the television industry as witnessing the rapid growth of the Internet and really seeing the handwriting on the wall. How does TV adapt to the endless long tail of the Internet and a fractured pop culture? Well, I mean, I think it's doing a pretty good job of it. I mean, uh, what? I mean, and I'm a very, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a web partisan. I, I mean, I, I, uh, I love the fact, I love that disruptive technology. I love what it's doing. I think it's making entertainment business better. Um, what it did was it fractured all the audiences so that, I mean, I used to walk into my office on Friday morning after our show was on Thursday night. And the PA would have written our uh, rating and our share on the board. And it was always, you know, 30 million or 30 shares. Or something. It was always huge. And that was just normal. And that wasn't that long ago. That was 1993. That was just normal for us. We just assumed that that was the case. And what the web has done and what a lot of other things have done, video games especially, the, 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 multi-purpose, uh, uh, the multi-purpose applications of that screen in your living room, right, just in general, and the fact that everyone has a big screen and a little, a series of little screens that they can uh, pay attention to. So not, not only the, the TV, but your laptop and your phone. And if you've ever been around anyone who's 20 or under, um, they don't ever watch TV without the phone or the laptop open. And if you've ever uh, you talked to anybody 30 and under, a lot of them don't have televisions and see no reason to get one. So what, what, it, does, what it does is it puts this giant margin squeeze on the business. So the business has to become... Um, more responsive and uh, more varied and has to go and find niches and, and dig them out. And so it, it's made programming better. I mean, I think the TV, the shows that are on TV right now are some of the best shows ever. Um, and it's good for conservatives, I think, because it means that, that, that we're not always going for the common denominator. We're not always going for the bland uh, platitudes of, of what, what most liberal television po- politics has been, which is like the, the right-thinking, roughly 1958 progressive attitudes, we don't have to see anymore because uh, the audience doesn't have to be that big. You know, we don't have to go for the, the bland center, which I think is great. I mean, we should be celebrating that. That is uh, the best news possible. Rob, I know you primarily work in television, but what did you make of the movie industry's rash of sequelitis this summer? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's exactly the problem, the other side of the problem that you mentioned with the web. Because when the margins get squeezed, right, so the top number that you can make in a movie starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller, the, the, TV, the, the TV business says, okay, if that's the case, then we're going to make a lot of, we're going to make smaller, nichier uh, television shows. And if we get a million viewers or two million viewers, we'll consider that a success. Feature films can't operate like that. They just, they just can't, they can't release that many pictures. It just costs too much money. So what they do is they release fewer pictures. I mean, Paramount is going to release 10 movies this year. Um, I mean, uh, uh, film production and distribution in Hollywood is down, I don't know, a lot, I mean, huge. Um, and so if you're only going to release a fewer number of movies, you want the movies you do release, you want them to be, you want to hedge your risk. You know, you don't want them to all be these one-off, this might work, that might work kind of movies. Because remember, the, 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 all of show business, and probably every other business too, but I only know show business, is governed just by fear, right? They don't, they, they're just afraid. And they come in the office and they sit at their desk and the first thing they feel is this horrible nausea and fear in their stomach. And they're looking for a way to make some money in, in the entertainment business, in the movie business especially, but not risk anything which, you know, we all know is impossible, but what they, tr- but instead of, like, just embracing the impossibility of that, what they do is they say, okay, well, everybody loved Iron Man, so I bet you, there, I bet you we can shove Iron Man 5 down their throat. And at that point, you start saying, okay, well, then I can spend $100 million on a movie, and remember, you spend, whatever you spend on a movie, you've got to spend at least double that on 
printed advertising, so the release, the P&A costs or the release costs, right? So, you know, a $100 million movie means you have to spend another $100 million to market it. And if it's Iron Man 4, well, you're probably going to get your money back. You know, that's a, you, know you, probably, you probably do okay. Um, and so that's, that's, it's just, that's the problem with the big studios is that they have this terrible business model that is the least flexible, least nimble thing ever. And they're just grinding out these sequels. And, um, I mean, it's working, right? They shrunk, and it's working. This was a good summer. Uh, box office numbers were up, but number of total number of viewers was down. So fewer people went to the movies, but they paid a little bit more. The movies made a little bit more money across all of their ancillary markets. So, you know, if you're in the movie studio business right now, you feel like you're doing okay. But, but you can read the handwriting on the wall. I mean, the business is... It's killing itself, uh, just killing itself slowly. And does that explain why something like Battleship, the motion picture? <laughs> yeah, right. you, you bought the game, now see the movie. Gets green Yeah, the, 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 the title was green-lighted. They didn't have a story for that movie. I, mean, I think it's coming out in the summer. I mean, it, it, and everybody's talking about that. I mean, even people, people in Hollywood all think that that is crazy. But, but if you're the studio, you're like, well... We're going to make a big disaster picture or a big CGI picture for the summer for holiday release. Nobody, it doesn't really matter what the story is, right? I mean, you know, Armageddon 2012, you know, it doesn't matter. So why not make one that has a title that some people have heard of so that maybe those people will, um, will go see it? Right, and that, that just that and it just makes your print and advertising a little bit more effective. I mean, these are terrible, terrible ways to grow a business, but the business is not in growth mode; it's in circle the wagons mode. And whenever that happens, you know, it's it's just you know it's over. I mean, you can't, you know, if you're not growing, you're you're shrinking. There's no staying the same. Now you're about to hear me. I'm going to go through this toll booth here, and a little verite for your <laughs> listeners. Here I am. It's five dollars to cross this bridge. Good lord! Give her twenty. Thank you. And then that's it. So that that, that right there is a sign of the California budget crisis in action. It was five dollars to cross that bridge, and uh, and I just saw. And one of those, I, you know that 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 the state worker there, she's got some fantastic pension plan. I should have asked her. Well, I wanted to ask you something about California politics, and this seems like a good time. Back in 2008, Richard Minniter, who recently dropped by Ricochet, wrote at Pajamas Media that Los Angeles was now the most puritanical city on the earth due to its regulations on food, smoking, environmentalism, and the like. We just saw Daryl Hannah get herself arrested at the White House because she believes American energy should come from unicorn flatulence, apparently. How does Hollywood hedonism square with its 21st century puritanism? Before we get to that, I say I, I think I was with Richard in L.A. when he wanted to smoke one of his trademark cigars. And you know, Richard's sort of a larger-than-life character, and he's a great reporter. He's a really terrific reporter. But he's kind, of, you know, he's definitely like he looks like a war correspondent, acts like a war correspondent. I mean, we, we should we should all we should have wars just so Richard could cover them. He's such a good writer. And I think he was so furious. Someone told him to put out a cigar. He was so furious that he sort of decided to, he was going to make his, you know, his next piece was going to be about this re- the regulations. So true, but I don't think L.A. is any different. I think that, you know, he, I don't think he ever imagined there would be such a thing as Mayor Bloomberg. My God, um, Bloomberg is trying to keep him from using salt and fat, which is idiotic. And, you know, so there's nothing wrong with salt. There's nothing wrong with fat. Um, uh, and doctors will tell you that. So, uh, but in terms of, like, Daryl Hannah, you know, it's interesting. It's like, uh, the, the two things that are interesting with Daryl Hannah, one is that she's 50. That surprised me. She's 50. So the girl, the girl, the mermaid in Splash is now a 50-year-old woman. But when celebrities get arrested, mostly they're arrested for things like beating up their girlfriend and uh, stealing jewelry, like Lindsay Lohan. They're not arrested for protesting uh, an oil pipeline, is what she was protesting. That the um, yeah, I think it's the Keystone Pipeline, something like that. The Keystone, they call it the Keystone XL, I think. Right. It's actually XL Extra Large. I mean, it goes from, it's supposed to be the XXL. It goes from Canada to the Gulf. It's this giant thing. 
Um, and so she, I mean, which sounds very 1970s to me, like a, a celebrity protesting a, an oil pipeline, doesn't it? I mean, we really truly are in 1978, where celebrities are uh, we're worried about a pipeline and we have a failed first term, you know, one term unpopular president. Um, <laughs> the economy's in the, in the, in the toilet. I, I, I think the difference is that people in Hollywood do not see their perks or their life or the way they live as something that's a choice. It's a very strange attitude here that, that, that everything becomes part of work. Everything seems to be work. So, you know, you'll talk to an actor and they will explain passionately to you why they needed that G5, the, the, you know, the Gulfstream and not the fly commercial. And it's, 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 it's for, you know, it's a work. It's, I have to do this. Um, why I, I need, uh, why I needed to build the house where I built it and, and spend the money I spent to build it because I have to, I have no choice. It's just the way it is. So you, you, you end up, I mean, they have, it's very, it's a very, um, subtle and a complicated psychological sort of, uh, um, uh, conundrum for them. And, but I don't think they do. I mean, I think people in Hollywood get it, get, get nailed for it. But I don't think that they're any worse. In fact, in many ways, they're better than, say, an Al Gore with his 77,000 million billion square foot house with, you know, hot and cold running heaters and, uh, you know, a foot massager in every room uh, flying around on a private jet just so he can scold you and tell you you've got to go to the bathroom in the dark or whatever it is he wants you to do. Uh, uh, I, I think Hollywood is at least at least they seem to be having fun, you know, uh, which uh, is, is the last. Is, a, is the last refuge of the conservatives, which is that our at least w- what we're selling you, if you if you follow our our pattern, is like you get to use the light bulbs you want and you get to have fun. Um, and it's the liberals who are telling you, no, you've got to you know live into this weird yellow flickery fluorescent bulb, and you you mustn't uh, you mustn't enjoy yourself with salt, fat, and tobacco. Well, that kind of dovetails into my next question. I've heard rumors from top level sources at PJM Management that you are quite the gourmet. <laughs> <laughs> wow, top level. Well, no, I do. I like to cook. I went to cooking school. I I, I enjoy it. I like cooking and drinking wine and uh, all those things that are you know supposed to be really bad for you. Um, I'm trying to do a little less of it now because you know you get you when you get a certain age, you just it, you don't lose any weight. You just you just continually sort of find new places and pockets to sort of hang off of your jacket of skin, right? Um, but uh, but yeah no I I mean I I am a, I am I am a complete not a hedonist but I I am a, I have no patience with the health police um, I think it's nonsense I think the, the USDA with their food pyramid you know 15 years ago I think they did enormous damage to the to the country I think people just felt like well the food pyramid says I should sit down and eat a big plate of pasta and I shouldn't eat any butter or meat and then you know suddenly there's an explosion of type 2 diabetes all across the country because guess what? Carbohydrates make you fat. Um, all that stuff, I mean, it, it, we'd be much better off if the government just stopped trying to help us, you know, because every time they really, they really put their mind to it and try to help us, they end up making us sicker, fatter. Rob, one more question about politics. This interview should be online before the president's big combination jobs and NFL kickoff speech on Thursday night. In the Baltimore Sun, David Zurawick wrote, and this is going to take a moment to set up, quote, President Obama still covets TV time, but the medium is no longer loving him back, unquote. Zurawick compares the allegedly media-savvy Obama of 2008 with his persona today and concludes, quote, not only isn't Obama the gifted TV performer he seemed to be during the 2008 campaign, TV is now one of his worst enemies, unquote. And eventually adding, quote, as I looked at the screen, I couldn't help thinking how diminished Obama looked and how thin his voice sounded. I wondered if there actually was something happening physically with him, unquote. So as someone who works in television, albeit in a different branch of the medium, what's your take on Obama and the medium, both in terms of what TV pundits think of the man and in general, how the president plays within the confines of the small screen these days? Well, you know, he somehow he makes the screen smaller, doesn't he? I mean, he was, used to be a big movie star. And now, you know, like, uh, we're just kind of seeing, watching this thing and thinking, this poor guy, he just swallowed up. I mean, even his suits seem too big now. Um, 
I, I just find it astonishing to me. Uh, it's astonishing that the, the, the entire brain trust, message brain trust in the White House is so deluded that they think the solution to Obama's problems is to make another speech. It just, to me, that's, uh, I, then there's nobody in that White House saying, no, actually, you know, the problem, there, there, there have been no dearth of Obama's speeches. The people have heard him. What they need to do is to not hear him for a while. Um, so I, I, that's what I find astonishing. These are, these are the people who, you know, who ran a pretty good campaign in 2008 and seemed like they had it all figured out. The problem, of course, is that they didn't really have it all figured out. Uh, they were running against a very weak candidate, and it was a change election and, a, and, a, and an electorate that wanted change. And he ran a very, very bland, very uh, hopeful, very vague campaign, which was very smart to get the White House. It's smart to become president, but it's not very smart if you want to do big, big things. So what it meant is that he had to come continually reappear in front of us to convince us to do the, say, the stuff that he kind of implied he wasn't going to do, the, the, the big liberal stuff. So then you find out the measure of the guy, if he's, can, he can persuade. And, you know, he just can't. And there, I think the reason he can't is because he's not really a star. Stars like people. Stars have uh, charisma and warmth, and you want them to like you, and you want to do something for them, and they look, they seem human. They seem like you, they care about you in a way that they, they not, not that they care about you whether you're happy or sad. I mean, most movie stars don't care about the audience that way, but they care about having you like them. They they're want they're you empathetic. Them. Yeah, and, and they feel, and, 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 they, and you feel their need, right? I mean, Bill Clinton, if you've ever been in a room where Bill Clinton was in the room, I mean, you could close your eyes and you knew where in the room he was just from the electricity that he gave off. And it wasn't electricity because, I mean, in the enormous amount of charisma, the guy shakes your hand. It's like you're getting zapped with 10,000 volts of synthetic charm. I mean, bang, you just feel it. And, and it's because he needed you to, to like him so much. And that ultimately is what a successful politician is, a very needy person. I mean, LBJ was that. And it happens when, they, when you've had a big career in politics and you've had some ups and some downs and you've had to go begging to the voters once or twice. And you've had, you know, what uh, we call, you know, a crap sandwich once or twice. Um, you, you, you just you have a humility and, a, and an ability to connect with people that is born, you know, creepily from desperation. But it's, in fact, a very effective way to govern. And. And the more we see Obama, the more we realize he doesn't give a damn about us. He doesn't think we're smart. He doesn't think that we need to, uh, uh, that we have uh, a, a valid perspective. He doesn't want to compromise. He just wants us to shut up and do it. He, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's exactly the president that you get if you elect, you know, a political science professor from fancy college. They don't really like politics. They don't really like people. They don't like voters. Uh, they just want us to shut up and take it. And, and people, they, they just feel that instinctively in the small screen. You know, they, TV does not lie. It just doesn't. You can't lie on television. It's too intimate. And you see him standing up there, and you realize this guy is completely unlike you and every other voter. And you can just feel the energy and the enthusiasm drain away. It's just, you can just feel it. You're just watching it. You can feel it. And it's... There's nobody home, and I think, I think we're discovering that, you know, every week, every week, and and then all this noise you hear, this noise about the speech he's giving in a, in a week, it's just, I mean, it's 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 awful, and I feel sorry for him because it's such a giant drum roll. I mean, the first rule of show business is, if you if you're gonna promise something, you, you have to you have to deliver. It has to be spectacular. You know, the drum roll, the end of the drum roll has got to be a real fanfare. Um, the old story about, you know, if you have a loaded gun on stage, that gun's got to go off uh, or people feel cheated. And we know exactly what his proposal for his job proposal is going to be. And it's just it's going to be one more thunking, thudding piece of nonsense, uh, rehashed 1970s style Keynesian nonsense. Uh, he's just trying to feed us big government, you know, uh, big government porridge. And everybody's turned away. Everybody's decided they don't want that. Uh, you know, this is the lost Walter Mondale administration, the lost uh, George McGovern administration. You know, uh, uh, Obama feels to me right now like he's like from another era, 
like he's from the past, you know? He just feels so old to me. All of his solutions are so old. They're all about government and big unions and all the stuff that most Americans have just kind of like, they're done with. So, I don't know, that's a very long rant, but I, I really do feel like, like Americans are done with him. They're just done with him. Well, if you were advising the GOP or if any of the Republican candidates tune into this interview or they hear you at ricochet.com, what advice would you give them for 2012? Well, I mean, I think that they, uh, they should not count their chickens um, because, uh, you know, there's um, the rule of politics is anybody can win, even the guy who's about to lose, right? So everything, everything can happen. Anything can happen. I would say, um, I, I mean, the, you, you have two totally natural impulses, right? One is let him ki- let the, let this guy kill himself, right? Let him continue to support these, you know, nonsense bad policies. Let him continue to push his uh, retreads from the 70s and just watch his negatives go up and his popularity drift down until he's really super vulnerable. Don't do anything. And then the second other, you know, the corollary to that is and then all, and, and for your for the, your part if you're the candidate, don't say anything. Don't don't propose anything. Don't get specific. Just let it happen. I think that's a mistake because I think that whoever's president in 2012 is going to have some very, very hard things to do. And he's going to have to take away some goodies. He's going to have to trim um, the uh, entitlement programs pr- pretty severely. He's going to have to redo the tax code. Uh, there are going to be a whole lot of Americans who aren't paying taxes now who are going to have to pay taxes. There are going to be a whole lot of Americans who have an allegiance to our current tax code, our, you know, 18,000-page tax law, and have found a million different ways to profit from it. And those are people who are going to be disappointed, too. So I would be as specific as possible. I mean, I, I would vote tomorrow for Paul Ryan. Uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's an embarrassment for everyone that the most serious, cogent, careful, detailed proposal for really saving, literally saving the country, was written by a congressman from Wisconsin who's not even running for president. Um, that's a bad. It's bad. They should jump in. I mean, I, I actually. I mean, I'm not a John Huntsman fan, but I, I think he gets a lot of credit for proposing, for putting up a real proposal for the future, of, you know, of, of a competitive country. Um, scrapping the tax code and the tax system right now, I think, is probably the best thing you can do. So, I don't know. That, that's, my advice would be counterintuitive. Uh, say something real. Say something real. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and persuade. And if you can do that, then if you do, you're lucky enough to take the oath of office in, in uh, 2013, you'll be way ahead. You'll have something to say. Okay. Well, this is Ed Driscoll, and we've been talking to Rob Long of Ricochet.com, who is off on the road to Napa. Although apparently Bing and Bob, I guess you're meeting Bing and Bob when you get to, to Napa. Uh, yeah, I, the traffic just kind of lightened up, so I'm making good progress. So I actually might, there's, there's, a, there's a chance I will make it by 6 o'clock tonight. That would be, it'll make everybody happy. Going to a wedding and the rehearsal um, is at 6, so the, the bride um, will be much happier to see me there at 6 o'clock than she would be to see me there at 6 o'clock. Um, I know enough to know that brides get tense right around now. (laughs) Well, Rob, we will let you put the pedal to the metal and get back to driving. And thank you once again for stopping by pajamasmedia.com. Enjoy the wedding.